Hello and assalamu alaikum uh, everyone. Uh, this is Kashif Kamran and I welcome you all to the advanced audit and assurance practice to pass webinar for exams in December 2020 uh, being organized by ACCA Pakistan. Uh, today is the day two of the webinar. Now just before starting on with the day two of the webinar, I just need a confirmation from all of you. Uh, can all of you hear me? Is my voice clear to all of you? And uh, can you see the screen in front of you? OK, that's uh, wonderfully good. So let's start on with the day two of the AAA webinar for exams in December 2020. Now the agenda of the day two is very important because on the day two today uh, we will be looking at the practice of the business risk particularly and on the sideline of the day two we will also be spending time on risk of material misstatement even though i have covered risk of material misstatement multiple times in my previous webinars now day two is important because business risk seems very important for upcoming exams in December 2020 and I thought I should spend a very good time with you on the understanding of the business risk and within my session today I will also be spending time on risk of material misstatement so it will be a very learning session for all of you and you will have deep insights about your mistakes about your problems about your issues when you are attempting a question on business risk or the risk of material misstatement. OK, now that that brings us to the day two, which is about business risk and risk of material misstatement. Uh, I will also be connecting the learnings of the day one yesterday uh, where I was very much concerned about examiner criticism and towards the end of the day one yesterday, I was focusing on the March 2020 examiner report and I was discussing with you the examiner report of the March 2020 sitting where the examiner had some concern about students and how the student puts the answer in the uh, in the in the exam context. So I will also be connecting the day one with the day two as well. So we have a better learning. OK, now in terms of the day two today. If you look at my previous webinars, uh, the hyperlinks are shared with you. Uh, I have done a webinar on risk of material misstatement. In September 19, you can watch that. Watch that. I have done a webinar on audit risk in March 19. You can also watch that. Uh, I have done a, a webinar on business risk in December 18. And even even I have done the audit risk in March 20 webinar. So you have plenty of resources where you can spend time on uh, beside this webinar and you can explore the risk of material misstatements, audit risk and business risk from my previous webinar. But in this webinar, I want to explore business risk in a very different manner and in a very useful manner for all of you so that you gain confidence in attempting a question on business risk. So let's start on with our journey on business risk and let's let's see how we need to be good at business risk. Now. Particularly for the day two today, uh, what you need to do. Uh, there is one article uh, which I will recommend and these articles and resources are there in the handout section of the webinar. You can see that you can download these uh, articles and all the documents which is required for the day two. The article for day two is exam technique article part two risk assessment. I, I did recommended you the five exam techniques article yesterday uh, out of the five. I will be I will be using the part two today, uh, which is about risk assessment. Then. The second thing we have to do today is examiner expectation. I, I want to do with you an analysis of the examiner do's and don'ts carefully because a lot of time we we have no idea about the examiner do's and don'ts when we are attempting a question on business risk. 
or risk of material misstatement. I will be doing a drilling with you of December 18 question number one because that is the most latest published question on business risk. Uh, business risk has also come after December 18, but the paper is not published. So this is the most latest published paper on business risk. So I thought I should be using the most latest one in terms of drilling the business risk question. And as an assignment for you, you will be drilling December 17 question. Now let's let's start on with the agenda and let's focus on the understanding of the business risk and all you need to know about business risk right from the day to today. Now examiner expectations, right? First of all, you should be very clear about the type of question you get in the exam paper. The question on business risk is a very straightforward question which asks students to evaluate the business risk. Now that's not a difficult question to understand. There is no complexity in the understanding of this question. Yes, the question which comes on the risk of material misstatement can be complex to understand and I will be putting emphasis on the risk of material misstatement uh, in the later half of my day to today. So currently I'm not focusing on risk of material misstatement. We'll spend time on it in the last one hour of my session today, but currently the focus is on business risk. So the requirement is very simple. Evaluate the business risk. Uh, it's nothing difficult to understand it, but let's see how we should go about it. Business risk. Uh, let's read the examiner uh, directly to extract the business risk understanding from an examination point of view. I've already recommended you an article uh, exam technique article part two, so that will give us the direct perspective of the examiner what we should be doing in terms of business risk. Now, if I take on my word file for the business risk analysis today for day two, I hope you can you can all see the word file in front of you for day two. Right, so if you can see the word file in front of you for day two, just a quick uh, confirmation from your site. If you can respond with yes or no. Can you see the word file in front of you? OK, that's that's perfectly good. OK, now in terms of the word file, uh, we are starting with the day two and the first objective of the day two is to look at business risk and the understanding of the business risk, right? Business risk, understanding and practice. So let's start with that. And in the later part, we will be going with the risk of material misstatement, right? OK, now in terms of the business risk understanding, the very first thing you should know is. Number one, source of learning. Where can you learn business risk from? Is, is there any source from where you can revise your understanding to business risk? Number one, number two, uh, marking scheme. What is the marking scheme of business risk? How many marks will you get when you write one business risk in exam paper? Number three, how to formulate an answer? How to formulate an answer? When you're writing an answer for business risk, how would you formulate an answer for business risk? How would you be assured that the answer you are writing is a very good answer? And number four, past papers on business risk. How many past papers can you do on business business risk? That's the next phenomena. So four things to focus on source of learning, the marking scheme, how to formulate an answer and a past papers on business risk. Let's let's go one by one with each one of them. The very first thing source of learning. The, the source of learning. You have your exam exam technique article. You have your exam technique article part two which is on risk assessment and I will be reading this article in my session today and there is a wonderful uh, coverage of business risk in this article, right? So if you read this article in a very good manner, there is a wonderful coverage of business risk and the understanding of the business risk in this particular article. So is, is there a source of learning? Definitely there is a source of learning marking scheme, right? Uh, for the marking scheme, uh, if you look at the most latest paper. Published on business risk. 
the most latest paper published on business risk, which you can access as a student, is December 18. So what will we do? We'll, we'll look at the marking scheme from the December 18 paper. We'll see the marking scheme of the examiner from the December 18 paper to identify how many marks will you be getting per business risk. So we need to be very careful about the marking scheme. So do we have any published paper after December 18? No. So the most latest paper available is December 18. So we will carefully evaluate the marking scheme of business risk from the December 18 paper. How to formulate an answer? That would be my third step today, and I will be guiding you about how to write a good answer on how to write a good answer. I, I'll write some answers with you on the screen in front of you so that you can know exactly how you write up a good answer. And then obviously the past papers on business risk, uh, the available papers which you can practice. The available papers, uh, a very old paper, December 2012, question number one. Uh, then another very old paper, December 2014, question number one. Then a paper came in December 2017, question number one, which I have recommended all of you to do as assignment. And then I am doing a question December 2018, question number one in my session today. So I will be doing this in my session and I recommended all of you to do this as an assignment. But if you want the old papers, December 12 and December 14, and you don't have them, I can share them with you over the WhatsApp group, which have been prepared for the practice to pass session, right? So source of learning, definitely. Marking scheme, I will be, I will be uh, going over the marking scheme with you. How to formulate an answer, I will be guiding you about writing a good answer and then there are available past papers in front of your screen. So I hope you're all mentally, mentally ready uh, to start with source of learning, right? So let's first start with source of learning. Let's see what you should be knowing about business risk. So let's first go with source of learning, source of learning on business risk. So we need to go to the exam technique article part two, and this is on risk assessment. Now, when you look at this exam technique article part two on risk assessment, let me put that in front of your screen. And this is already in the handout section, so you can download that from there. Look at this article in front of your screen. I hope you can all read that. This is an exam technique article right here. So this is an exam technique article right here. And this exam technique article is about risk assessment. You can scroll down and you can see over here it says part two risk. Now this is the page one of the article, right? So when you read the article, you have to read the article in full because you are covering audit risk risk of material misstatement and business risk. But I need to take you to the particular page where examiner has spent time on business risk. So leave the first page and scroll down. When you scroll down and you come to the page number two, right? On the page number two, the very first thing you will find is the definition, is the definition of a business risk. That is very, very important because a lot of time you don't know the definition and then you don't know how to pick up a business risk. You should be clear about what is the definition of a business risk because this definition will really help you with the understanding of what is a business risk. Just just give me one minute before I interact with you on on the definition of of the business risk. I am just interacting with you. I just need to open up the article uh, where I can just interact with you. So just give me one minute for that. OK, I hope you can see the article again in front of your screen. This is the ex exam technique article part two on risk. We were just discussing this that you need to come to the page number two. On the page number two, you will find the definition, right? So you can all see the definition on the page number two here. So 
In terms of the definition on the page number two, this is the definition, right? You have to read. Let's let's explore the definition. Okay, now it says a business risk is a risk resulting from significant conditions, significant events, circumstances, actions or inactions that could adversely affect the entity's ability to achieve its objective and execute its strategy or from the setting of the inappropriate objectives and strategy ISA 315. It is giving you a very good mindset about what is a business risk. It says it is a risk which results from a significant condition. It is a risk which results from a significant event or it is a risk which results from a significant action or inaction that could adversely affect the objective of the organization or it could be a wrong strategy of the organization or it could be setting wrong strategies for the organization which can be a business risk. So let's let's explore this definition here. Uh, quickly uh, because we need to spend time on the past paper. What is the business risk? Uh, the ISA 315 is telling us what is the business risk. Let's let's make that definition concise. Uh, the ISA 315 is telling us that a business risk is a risk which arises from a which is basically a risk resulting from it is a risk resulting from Number one, a significant condition, uh, event, or a circumstances, or an action, or an inaction, or an inaction which could adversely affect the objective of the organization. It is a risk, right? It is a risk which results from a significant condition. It is a risk which results from a significant event. It is a risk which results from a significant circumstances. It is a risk which results from a significant action or an inaction, which which eventually compromise the objective of the organization, or which which eventually uh, affects the objective of the organization, right? Which affects the objective of the organization of the organization now you all know the objectives of the organization right every organization has some critical success factors now there can be some significant conditions events circumstances there could be uh, a significant condition could be the covid 19 uh, the significant condition could be the political environment the significant uh, events could be a fire in the warehouse. A significant circumstance could be any dramatic changes in the industrial environment or or or, or your competitor or your competitor becoming very tough or your rival becoming very tough. You, you know the business environment, right? Uh, the business environment is influenced by the competitors. Uh, the business environment is influenced by the political environment, the economic environment, the social environment, the technological environment. Uh, at times, the management takes an action, but that is a wrong action. Even a wrong action can affect the objective of the organization and inaction. At, at times, there can be a certain inaction that the management has not taken an action which compromise the objective of the organization. So your action might be wrong or you fail to take an action in action, which which results into affecting the objective of the organization. Now, what are objectives of the organization? Objectives of the organization primarily includes profit, profitability for every organization, uh, maximization of the market share, maximize market share, reputation, reputation of an organization, uh, growth in sales, growth in sales, stakeholder satisfaction, stakeholder satisfaction, stakeholder satisfaction so there are multiple objectives for an organization right profitability maximizing the market share reputation growth in sales stakeholder satisfaction or having a competitive advantage having a competitive advantage 
right? Obviously, profitability means maximizing the wealth of shareholder. So for every organization like a listed company, for every organization like a company listed on a stock market, you have a desired objective. Now, anything which can impact upon your objectives will be a business risk. Is that clear to everyone? Anything which affects your objectives, right? Anything which affects your objective will be a business risk. A significant condition can affect your objective. A significant event can affect your objective. A significant circumstances can affect your objective or a action, a wrong action can affect your objective or even a inaction, even a inaction also affects your objective. So is that clear to everyone? So when you are reading a case study in the exam paper, uh, what you need to do as a student, uh, as a student, it's very simple. As a student, your step number one is to read the case, read the case. And when you're reading the case, your step number two is to identify or your step number two is to annotate any condition, any event, any circumstances, any action of the management or any inaction of the management. You need to identify that. And then in the step three, you need to think uh, how will the how will the above affect the business objective? You need to ask a question to yourself. So in the step two, you will annotate any condition, event, circumstance, action or inaction from the case study, right? And then you will think that if I have annotated a condition or if I have annotated an event or if I have annotated a circumstance, why? How will this affect the business objective? Will it affect the profitability? Uh, will it affect the market share? Uh, will it affect the reputation of the company? Uh, will it affect the growth in sales? Uh, will it affect the stakeholder satisfaction? Why? How? So as a student, just step number one, as a student, a step number two, as a student, your step number three, and finally, obviously, a step number four is to formulate an answer, is to formulate an answer. And these are the four steps, right? So is that clear to everyone? So is everyone clear with the definition of the ISA 315 that a business risk is what? And what is the effect of the business risk? Right, so as a student, you need to do the step number one, two, three, four. Right, I hope you're clear and I'm moving onwards. This is not the end of the business risk, right? We still need to read a lot on business risk before we start with practice. I will be spending another 15 minutes on uh, learning of the business risk before I shift my focus towards the practice, which is more important. Okay, I hope you're all ready. I'm moving on. Okay, you come back to the article. And in the article we were reading, Okay, page number two, right? Now scroll down from the page number two and move to the page number three. Now see on the page number three, can you see the business risk coming again? So on the page number two, you got the definition, right? Then on, a, on the page number three, examiner is giving you a better understanding of the business risk. Let's, let's read that quickly and let's find, is there something critical which we need to understand from this particular page number three, because that will wrap up our discussion on business risk and will bring us closer to the start of the practice. Okay, now if you look at the page number three in front of you, it says business risk for the purpose of exam. So examiner is saying for the purpose of exam, these risks can usually be thought in terms of conditions that may prevent a business from meeting its objective. So in terms of the exam, these are conditions that may prevent a business from meeting its objective, right? We've already covered that and might include risk to achieving future profits, might include risk to achieving future profits or cash flows or to the business survival. So the examiner is saying the business risk might not be in present or might not be historical. It might relate with your future. Now, when we identified the risk of material misstatement or when we identify the audit risk, do you believe audit risk pertains to an historical financial statement? 
risk of material misstatement pertains to an historical financial statement. Am I right? Do you all agree with me? Do you believe audit risk and risk of material misstatement relates with the financial statement and financial statements are historical? But is the examiner telling us that the business risk may only be historical or the business risk may be in future? So can can it can something affects your future profit and be a business risk in exam paper? Can something affects your future cash flows and be a business risk? So can a business risk be in present and future in the exam paper? So examiner is saying that the business risk could be something which affects your what? The examiner is saying further. Further, this is on the page three, right? This is on the page three of the article and the page three of the article is telling us that a business risk can relate with events or conditions which could affect what which could affect the future which could affect the future profitability which could affect the future cash flows liquidity which could affect the future future survival of the business you you might think that the business might close down in future the survival of the business the foreseeable future so in the exam paper will we just be focused on a risk affecting the present scenario of the company or will we also be focused on risk affecting the future of the company waiting for your answers so will we just be looking at something affecting the present of the company or will we also be looking at situations in the exam paper which might affect the future of the company so is everyone clear so business risk can relate with events or conditions which could affect the future profitability cash flows and survival of business do you think profitability is one of the business objective agree do you believe cash flows is one of the business objective liquidity liquidity itself is one of the objective right liquidity is one of the objective right and survival of the business the going concern right going concern itself is one of the business objective i hope you all agree with me so can you think about them as business objectives the one coming in front of your screen right so further page three of the article is giving us some very good idea about what a business risk could be okay let's move back look at the next paragraph it says this is simplified this is simplified explanation but will help you describe the implication of most of the risk you come across in the exam exam paper see what is the examiner telling you examiner is telling you that this will help you describe the implications of most risk you come across in the exam paper so most of the risk you will face in the exam paper will either link to profit or will either link to cash flows or will either link to business survival so examiner is saying these are very very important areas and most of the risk you will come across in the exam paper will focus on the three then after the full stop the examiner says there will be some risk whose explanation is more involved and you can find examples of these in the past paper examiner is saying you can find examples in the past paper so the more you practice the past paper the better how many total past papers you need to practice for business risk uh, have i just mentioned that in my lecture today how many total past papers you have on business risk which you can practice just four right so four is a big number no four is a very small number if you practice four out of four will you be good on business risk will you have good examples of business risk if you practice all the four past papers on business risk so please ensure that you do all the four past papers look at the next paragraph the next paragraph tells us in journal you are looking for risk in the information that the examiner has presented you within the scenario is that right you are looking for the risk in the information that the examiner has presented you in the scenario so from where will you identify the risk from the case study right from the information the examiner has given to you you will be asked to evaluate those risks at this level at this level you will not be credited for defining the business risk 
So examiner is saying when you are evaluating the business risk, you will not be getting any marks. You will not be getting any marks if you define a business risk, nor you will receive credit for describing what a client should do, what a client should do to mitigate those business risks. So will you get any marks for defining a business risk? Will you get any marks for defining a business risk? No. Will you get any marks for telling examiner the mitigation of a business risk? Will the examiner give you any marks if you tell him the mitigation of the risk? No. So should we spend time on telling examiner the mitigation? Not at all. We should just be telling examiner the risk. So please be very focal here, right? We are getting something very important here. Should not write, should not write definition of business risk, definition of business risk, should not write mitigation of business risk, mitigation of business risk. So what you should do, you should just focus on your focus should be on number one, identify a business risk, identify a business risk. Number two, explain why it is a business risk. And number three, its impact on the business objectives. Its impact on the business objective. Identify number one, explain why number two, and number three tells the impact of the risk on the business objective, and you will be rewarded. Is that is that clear to everyone? So you're not writing definitions, right? You're not writing mitigations. You will not say, oh, I, I, I saw the examiner answer and in the examiner answer, the examiner was writing the mitigation. Examiner can write mitigations in the answer because the answer is the tutorial guidance. But the examiner in the article is telling you not to write the mitigation. So is the article of an XYZ author or is the article of the examiner? So you cannot just say, oh, I, I read the I read the examiner answer and in the examiner answer I saw the mitigation. What you should do in the exam paper. Should you write mitigations in the exam paper or not? What is the examiner telling us? Should we write mitigations? Everyone. Should we write mitigations? Not at all, right? Not at all. We should just focus on risk. You should just focus on risk. You so your focus is on what? Your focus is on just to evaluate the business risk, not anything else, not anything else, right? So let's move back to the case. Okay. Then the remaining is just miscellaneous. You can just spend time if you want to and uh, see over here, the examiner is giving you the marking scheme on the bottom of the page three. You can see the marking scheme. Examiner is saying for identifying without any explanation. If you identify the risk, you will get half a mark. Half a mark for identifying. For briefly explaining business risk, one mark will be awarded. For briefly explaining the business risk, one mark will be awarded. And full marks, full marks will only be awarded where a well explained business risk is presented. If you identify a risk, how many marks will you get? Just half. But if you briefly explain it, you will get one. So that's one and 0.5, one and a half. But if you fully explain it in a very proper manner, examiner is saying you will get full marks. How many full marks are there for every business risk? Two. I will just be showing you the marking scheme, right? A good business risk is worth two marks. Examiner is saying marks will not be awarded on any speculative risk. You cannot just write speculative business risk. I will I will be guiding you on that. Your focus is on the risk given in the case study. So you just need to focus on the case study and you just need to identify the risk from the case study. The last point. Avoid speculative risk. Avoid speculative risk. Just focus on the case study. Just focus on the case study and the information given in the case. Don't take any hypothetical assumptions. And the last thing uh, on the business risk is the marking scheme. Let's let's look at the marking scheme for a business risk before we start the exercise. Marking scheme for a business risk. 
Now, what is which is the latest paper available on business risk? December 18, right? So should we look at the marking scheme from December 18 and take that as the right rule for exams in December 20? Everyone. So let's let's explore. Uh, I, I will be giving you examples of speculative when I start drilling my December 18 paper because when I start the exam paper, then only I can tell you what is speculative and what is information given in the case study, right? So <clears throat> avoid speculative risk. Don't don't try to find a risk which is not in the case study. Don't assume a risk, right? Don't take an hypothetical assumption. Just be very particular about the information given in the case study, right? Okay, marking scheme. Now, you all know that examiner publishes the answer, right? Now, this is the December 18 answers in front of you. Can you all see this is December 18 answers in front of you? These are December 18 exam paper answers and all of all of you have a very a good habit of reading examiner answers. I think that is the most important resource for ACCA students and they believe this is the only source uh, ACCA has published for them because you don't read examiner reports. Uh, you don't read the marking schemes. Uh, you don't read the articles, but you do read examiner answers and that increases your stress level. If you read the examiner answers without reports, without marking scheme, without articles, you will think, OK, this is how much I have to write. Honestly, honestly, tell me when you read the examiner answer, how many of you think this is how much we have to write, which is wrong. Now your your examiner was telling you not to write the mitigation of risk. Now when you read the answer of the examiner on business risk, you will find examiner writing mitigations. Now if you just read the examiner answer in isolation, what definition will you take for exam paper? If you just read the answers in isolation, right? If you just read the examiner answers in isolation, what definition will you take to the exam hall that we should write mitigation? But tell me, is that the right definition or is that the wrong definition? Quick answers. Is, is that the right? Is that the, is that the wrong perspective? So should you read these answers in isolation? Never. Because a lot of time the student believe this is the only source. This is the only source and and honestly, honestly uh, for a student community. For a student community, uh, these answers is something which inspires the student community, right? I, I, I hope I'm right in that. These, these are these are your inspirations, right? You, you dream of writing an examiner answer someday and you think that the, the day we write the examiner answer, we will get passed in the AAA paper. And I think that dream will never come true. You, sh you should realize that sooner or later. You, you need to make your own answer, right? You cannot just get inspired with the examiner answer. You need to develop your own point. Okay, now let's see in this answer booklet, when you go to the last page of the answer booklet, which is the last two to three pages, I hope you have ever seen this. Look at this. In the last two, last two to three pages of the answer booklet for every exam setting, right? For every exam setting, you will see the marking scheme, right? This is the marking scheme coming on the last pages. Can you see this December 18 marking scheme? Can all of you see this? And you don't bother to read the marking scheme. You just bother, bother to read the examiner answers. Now, can you see the examiner is giving you the marking scheme for business risk here for the most latest question? And and just read yourself the marking scheme given here. I'm just copying the marking scheme from here. This is the marking scheme, right? Uh, read read this in orange. Read this in orange yourself. I, I'm not misguiding you, right? This is given in black and white in the December 18 answer of the examiner. You read answers, but you don't read marking scheme. Okay. Can can you see business risk marking scheme in front of your screen and can you just read that in a minute what I highlighted in orange and after you read it just tell me you have read it quickly. I'm giving you one minute. Just just read what I highlighted in orange and do tell me that you've read it before I do an analysis on it. Okay, so most of you have read right 
uh, what what is coming in orange right now if i just take that exactly on my word file what is the examiner telling us the examiner is telling us that this is the marking scheme of a business risk you have to go through an exam in december 2020 because that's the most latest one available right we cannot have an, another paper this is the most latest so the examiner is saying up to two marks for each audit risk explained that that is a mistake right in the marking scheme they should have used the word business risk because right over here if you see examiner is putting the heading business risk and mistakenly under the business risk he's saying for each audit risk should have been the business risk right so that that's a typing mistake by the examiner so up to two marks for each business risk right do correct that up to two marks for each business risk identified and explained so is everyone clear on that so the maximum marks we will get per business risk is how many two up to two marks for each business risk identified and explained marks may be awarded for other relevant business risk not included in the marking guide now examiner is saying i will reward you marks even for a business risk which is not in my answer there might be a possibility that you find a business risk from a different perspective in exam paper and the examiner has not found that but examiner is saying i will also be awarding you marks if you find a relevant business risk not included in the marking guide relevant relevant can you look at this word relevant a lot i think majority of the students don't even know the meaning of the word relevant relevant means case study not hypothetical not out of the case study so how many marks we will get per business risk two so two marks right but then the examiner is saying in addition can you look at this word in addition here is it does in addition means extra than two do you agree with me does in addition means something extra than two agree or disagree can you see this word in addition what is what is the literal meaning of the word in addition is is it extra is it extra than two so is it included in two or is it extra than two this is extra right this is not included in two right this is extra so examiner is saying in addition i will allow half a mark so examiner will give you half a mark for relevant trend which form parts of the business risk evaluation which form parts of the business risk evaluation so you will you get an extra half a mark for relevant trends which relevant trends which form part of the answer can you get half a mark if 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 that relevant trend does not fo form part of the answer be, be very critical right see examiner is giving you an example example percentage increase in revenue but if the percentage increase in revenue is used in your answer then only you will get half a mark but if you just isolated isolatedly calculated a percentage increase in revenue but you didn't use that percentage increase in revenue in your answer will you be awarded half a mark so Will you get half a mark just by identifying the trend or just when you use that in your answer? Be, be very skeptical about that, right? See, now what is the marking scheme of a business risk, everyone? Uh, so business risk means that for every business risk, how many marks will I be getting? For every business risk, I will be getting identify plus explain and is equal to two marks per business risk right plus 0 0.5 marks if any trend is identified if any trend is identified and used as part of the business risk answer so if any trend is identified and used as part of the business risk answer if any trend is identified and used as part of the business risk answer then only will you get half a mark in isolation or will you get half a mark when you identify and when you use look at the two yellows look at the two yellows in front of your screen you identify and you use as part of your answer right the relevant trend can be examiner is giving you examples right the relevant trend can be increase in revenue 
or relevant trend can be a decrease in profit. So uh, you you might find a percentage decrease in profit, and you say the profit of the company has already reduced, and you tell by 10%. So when you are saying the profit has reduced, you can find the percentage of the profit, and you can you can tell examiner that the profit has reduced by 25%. So you you use that right as part of your answer. So is everyone clear on the marking scheme of business risk? In journal, how many marks we get for every business risk? Two. But can we get an extra half a mark? So can there be a business risk worth two marks? And can there be a business risk worth two and a half marks? Am I right? So can there be a business risk worth two marks? And can there be a business risk worth two and a half marks? If if a trend is included in your answer. Right, is everyone crystal clear on the marking scheme? So is, is there a source to learn the marking scheme? Is there a source from where you can also revise the marking scheme rather than asking the tutor? Can you kindly tell us the marking scheme? So is there a source to revise the marking scheme? So please ensure that you revise the marking schemes from a relevant source. So this is the marking scheme of the business risk, right? So I hope you have knowledge. Now this is the time to start on with the December 18 paper. December 18, question number one, let's start it and let's explore business risk. Because right after the break, we need to spend time on business risk and right after the break, we'll go down with the analysis of risk of material misstatement. Okay, I'm putting in front of your screen the question paper from December 18. Can all of you see the question paper in front of you? Right for for every business risk, you will not have a trend, right? So you cannot say every business risk can be two and a half marks because trend trend cannot be possible with every business risk, right? So there might be a risk worth two marks without trend, and with trend, it will be two and a half marks, right? So not necessarily you say, okay, every business risk is worth two and a half marks because finding a trend for every business risk will be impossible in exam context, right? Okay, can all of you see the December 18 paper in front of your screen? Okay, that's good. So if you see the December 18 paper in front of your screen, right here, you scroll down the December 18 paper, and I, I, I told you how to read the exam paper, right? You first read the introductory page of the question number one and the introductory page will give you some very important information and then you read the exhibits, right? I did demonstrate it the way of reading the question number one in my day one yesterday, right? Okay, now you go down and you come to the requirements. Please also watch my day one if you missed that because on the day one, I did guided you about how to read the question paper. Now, when you come to the question number one, look at the requirement number A. The requirement number A is to evaluate the business risk. How many marks we have to evaluate the business risk? Just eight. We know the marks on business risk have been very low. Maximum marks which came on business risk has been 10 or in a worst case scenario can be 12. Examiner never give you high marks on business risk because in the B part, examiner will either give you a risk of material misstatement or the audit risk. So can you see in the in the B part, the examiner is asking risk of material misstatement for another 18 marks. So business risk always come for less marks, right? But another another philosophy with business risk is business risk never comes alone. Whenever you find a business risk question in the B part, you will find a risk of material misstatement or in the B part, you will find audit risk. I hope that's clear to all of you, right? So we are currently focusing on the A part, which is to evaluate the business risk facing the company and the marks are eight. Right, okay, now let's do the analysis and start answering the question. Okay, we need to evaluate the business risk and the examiner says you have eight marks. Okay, now that means technically, if I just keep the lower side in mind and I just plan myself, when I'm planning, I'll say, okay, I have eight marks. And on the minimum side, if I divide them by two, two minimum marks, I will reach four business risk. But if I find a business risk worth two and a half marks, uh, if I find multiple risk worth two and a half marks, 
automatically I might even write less than four business risk. I might wrap up my answer with three business risk. So eight marks technically divided by two and we are thinking about writing four business risk. Right, so is that clear to everyone? So knowing that we need to find four business risks from the exam paper, let's start reading the case study and let's see how can we be clever in identifying the business risk. Do you all remember the definition of business risk I formulated with you just uh, 30 minutes ago? That it arises from an event, condition, circumstance, action or inaction, which could adversely affect, right? Now again, if you have any question, and your tutor is not responding to your question uh, because the tutor is busy delivering the webinar. So it is very, very ethical that you put that question on the WhatsApp group. The tutor has made a WhatsApp group for you, right? Or you can at least WhatsApp the tutor and the tutor will be responding to your question in the next 24 hours rather than you keep putting that same question uh, again and again, which causes an irritation and a distraction for the tutor conducting the webinar. I, I hope that's clear with everyone. OK, so we have eight marks, two minute, two minimum marks for business risk. Let's see how to go about it. Now, once you know how many business risks to write, you should read the case. You should read the case and then you should identify the business risk. And when you identify the business risk, you should explain why and you then, then think of the impact on the business objective. Think about the impact on business objectives. Is that right to everyone? Is that clear to everyone? So is that what we should be doing exactly? We should read the case. We should identify. We should explain why and we should think about the impact on the business objectives, right? And if we find any relevant trend, we will pick up the relevant trend, right? If any relevant trend identified. If any relevant trend identified. Will use that in answer for an extra 0 0.5 marks. So please plan your answer before you start reading the case study. A lot of time the students don't plan the answer and that is eventually when when you're reading the case study, the reading of the case study becomes useless. Now one very good thing which I would recommend you you can do uh, before we start reading the case study is that in the when you're practicing at home, right when you're practicing at home. And suppose you write your own answer of business risk, right? Suppose you're practicing at home, right? You're practicing at home. Uh, the December 18 paper, for example, question number one, and you're practicing at home the business risk, right? And uh, you you wrote your answer. You wrote your answer. And you wrote your answer for business risk. Now, yesterday I t told you that when you write your answer, you should compare your answer with the examiner report so that you know what you did right and what you did wrong. Now look at the second perspective when you wrote your answer for business risk and you want to check whether your answer is right or wrong. Right, the very first thing you should do is the step number one and the step number two. How would you self appraise your answer? Because not every time you can ask your tutor to check your answer, but you need to have a self appraisal of your answer. How would you assure that the self appraisal you are doing of your answer is right or wrong? In the step number one, when you want to check your answer, whether your answer is right or wrong, in the step number one, read the examiner marking scheme and try to reconcile try to reconcile the the business risk pointers try to reconcile the business risk pointers given in the marking scheme try to reconcile uh, the pointers given in the business risk marking scheme business risk marking scheme with your points with your points and see how many matches how many matches if the match is if the match is like 50% uh, or more that's good that's good because the examiner was saying not necessarily your entire answer matches with me 
right? So look at the step one. I'm I'm just demonstrating all of you the step one, right? Just just read the step one for one minute and tell me you have read it. And please ensure that it makes sense to you, right? Just just read the step number one yourself and tell me you read it and understood it. I'm giving you one minute, right? Now it's less than one minute. And did you understood it? Read the examiner marking scheme and try to reconcile the business risk pointers given in the marking scheme with your answer with your points and see whether it matches if it even matches like 50. It's good. Am I saying read the examiner answer or am I saying read the examiner pointers given in the marking scheme? Pointers pointers given in the marking scheme is something different, right? Now suppose. You write a business risk answer and you will go to the examiner answer. Can you see the business risk marking scheme in front of your screen? Everyone. Which we just read. And under the business risk marking scheme. Can you see the examiner pointers here? Can you see examiner pointers here? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So how many business risk is the examiner giving you in pointers? Nine. How many you have to find? Just four to score eight marks. Examiner will always give you more because the examiner wants to give you knowledge. The examiner is telling you all of them were business risk. All of them were business risk. If you even find four of them, I will give you marks. So what is the potential to identify business risk in December 18 paper? A total of nine. Out of the nine, if even four if even four of your business risk reconciled, that's wonderful. So do you need to write nine business risk for uh, for eight marks? Do you need to write nine business risk for eight marks? Answers no only, only four. Why, why is the examiner writing nine? Why is the examiner writing nine? He wants to give you. The examiner wants to give you what the guidance the knowledge. So when you read the full answer of the examiner, how many business risk will the examiner written in the full answer? How many business risk the examiner has written in the full answer? A total of nine. So any student can get distracted. One student can say, oh, examiner wrote nine business risk. That means I also have to write nine business risk. And you are wrong. So can you see the pointers in front of your screen? Uh, have you ever used pointers to reconcile your answer ever? Anyone? Has anyone ever used pointers to reconcile answers? I think most of you most of you read the answer not not the pointers. Please make a habit of reading the pointers because pointers are good. If your point matches with the examiner point, that's wonderful. If your point matches with the examiner point, that's wonderful. But your explanation can differ from the examiner explanation because that sets the human psyche. So my point should match right. Right? Is everyone clear? So. In in the step number one. The point the step number one means your point. Your point should match your point should match the examiner point. Your point should match the examiner point. Rather your answer. Are you getting the point? So your point should match the examiner point rather than the answer. Because the the way the way you explain the way you explain it. And the way examiner explains it. Is different and you can have you can never match that even if I explain something and you explain something. Will it match never even if you explain and your friend explain will it match never. But will the point of your friend and the point of your match. It will will my point and your point match it will but will the answer match never. So what you should reconcile should you reconcile your answer with the examiner answer or you should reconcile the pointer with your pointer. I, I, are you getting my point everyone? Are you crystal clear on this? So is everyone getting the sense of uh, connecting the pointer with the pointer connecting the examiner point with your points. Okay, that's good. So will you be doing this in the remaining five weeks before your exams? 
and will you will you read the examiner marking schemes will you read the examiner pointers and reconcile that so is is it something good for you okay and what is the second way to appraise your answer which i guided you yesterday the second way to appraise your answer is read the examiner report read the examiner report read the examiner report for december 18 question number 1 and see what and see the criticism and see the and see the criticism or rather read the criticism read the criticism on business risk read the criticism on business risk to see whether you have done something whether you have done something given in the criticism did i guided you about this yesterday did i guided you this in the day one everyone right so read the examiner report will you go to the december 18 examiner report question number one and read the criticism on business risk to see whether you have done something given in the criticism and if you have will it give you an opportunity to correct for the future exams so do you understand how you self appraise your answer because a lot of time the student keep running after the tutor kindly check my answer kindly check my answer how can you do a self appraisal of your answer is everyone getting the way of a self appraisal of the answer will you follow this is that a good approach so if you're practicing at home and you write an answer follow the step number one and follow the step number two and that will really improve the quality of your answer before you give your actual exam on the 7th of december right so this technique can really change the way you can improve your answer because a lot of times students find difficulties in improving their answer and this technique can really really improve your answer from the examination perspective right the examiner marking schemes uh, is given right in the answers you you know the answers of the examiner right muhammad junaid you can download the examiner answers and in the last two pages of the examiner answer you will see the marking scheme so the marking scheme is part of the examiner answers right the same document most of the student uses okay so let's start the business risk understanding now let's start to solve the business risk right i'm taking on the fresh page now and we'll start to solve the business risk I'm, i will just give you a clue how to write a good answer and you will continue this yourself right okay how to write a good business risk answer for December 18 paper, right? Just let's spend time on it. I will be spending 30 minutes on it, just reading and identifying four risks will be guiding you on that. I've already done a previous webinar on business risk, which will guide you more. And uh, uh, I hope with this webinar and the previous webinar on business risk, you will be formulating a very good answers on business risk. Okay, just going down with reading of the case study. Okay, we need to identify four business risks. Let's start to read the case study, right, uh, of the Red Back Sports Company. When you come to the exhibit number two, uh, which gives us the background information about the company of which we are the auditor. So this background information will help us getting to know the business risk. So I, I, I even mentioned this yesterday that the exhibit two is very important because the exhibit two really gives you the business background and this business background will help you identify the business risk not only will you find the business risk from a business background when you go to the exhibit number three when you go to the exhibit number three can you see what's given in the exhibit number three the exhibit number three contains the financial statements so do you believe you can even identify a business risk from the financial statements extracts of the management accounts so please remember that whenever you are identifying a business risk in exam paper when you are identifying a business risk right and for a business risk when you are reading the case when you're reading the case you will find business risk from two sources one from the business background because the business background will give you the knowledge of the business and from the knowledge of the business you can identify the events 
you can identify the circumstances from you can find the events you can find the circumstances you can find the actions you can find the inactions from the business background which can affect the which can affect the business objective right and then you can find the business risk from the financial information given from the financial information given because from the financial information uh, you might get to know uh, the financial position of the company now just just an example before we read the business background look at the look at the financial statements right and just just skim through the financial information can you see in the financial information there are some potential issues here one of the potential issue here is the cash look at the cash do you believe it is worsening the liquidity of the business look at the cash look at the cash in the 2009 and look at the cash in the last year do you believe it's it's indicating liquidity do you believe it's indicating that the business is facing some liquidity problems so can the numbers can the analysis of number itself portray a business risk can the analysis of number itself portray a business risk am i right am i wrong waiting for your answers so please ensure that you should analyze the numbers analyze the numbers carefully because if you analyze the numbers carefully the numbers itself the numbers itself can lead to business risk now do you believe there is a business risk here that have you found uh, a business risk number 1 which is a uh, fall in cash fall in cash do you all agree with this a fall in cash how much is a fall in cash can you identify the percentage anyone have found the percentage of the fall in okay that's wonderful uh, 75% right so there is a 75% fall in the cash balance over the last year okay 75% fall in cash over the last year now if i use the 75% in my answer will i get an extra half a mark a 75% fall in cash over the last year will will this 75% give me extra half a mark everyone okay so this 75% will give me an extra half a mark and if i explain the business risk what is the business risk if i explain the business risk i will get another two marks for explaining the business risk right so this can this can conclude into a 2.5 marks business risk is everyone getting that so i i need to link the fall in cash to the case study i cannot just i i cannot just comment on fall in cash in isolation i need to do a proper comment on fall in cash looking at the case study rather than i just make a journal point that a fall in cash demonstrates the liquidity problem for the business and the fall in cash has been 75% this will not give me marks so suppose if you're writing this as a business risk right for example let's look at the weak answer and let's look at the strong answer quickly i will do some 3 to 4 efforts like this uh, before the break and i hope you get a good clarity suppose a weak answer a student found a 75% fall in cash without even reading the case study did did i read the case study did i read the business background everyone did i read what is happening in the business background no but do, do i know from the financial information that the cash is falling by 75% so i just look at a cash falling by 75% without even reading the business background and i started to write my answer like this there has been a fall in cash balance there has been a fall in cash balance by 75% over the last year over the last year which demonstrates which demonstrate that the company is facing some liquidity issues the company is facing some liquidity issues full stop the liquidity issues if worsen if worsen can bring doubt on the business 
ongoing concern or can bring doubt on the business survival in future if right not not sure i'm saying if there has been a fall uh, the liquidity issue if versions can bring doubt on business going concern survival in future full stop so can can a business risk be in future was that examiner telling us right so this is a weak answer right because you didn't read the case you just saw okay there is a 75 percent fall and the 75 percent fall is a liquidity issue and because it's a liquidity issue it will bring a doubt on the business going concern now this is a weak answer and interestingly a lot of students are saying your answer looks strong now now look at my strong answer if you believe this weak answer is strong then look at the strong answer and then then judge right okay should should we formulate a strong answer should we read the case to formulate a strong answer okay are you all ready now you all know there is a 75 percent fall in cash right come back to the case study now knowing there is a 75 percent fall in cash just give me one minute can you see there has been an increase in the capital expenditure over the last year and this year last year the capital expenditure was 20 this year the capital expenditure is 32 million so do you do you see there is a surge in capital expenditure and can that can that be one of the reason of the fall in cash balance the high amount of capital expenditure do you all agree with that do you believe a capital expenditure is an outflow a capital expenditure is a pressure is a pressure on your cash flows and and has the business increased capital expenditure over the last year right okay you all agree with that right you all agree with that that's good okay do you believe the business has taken on more leisure centers here look, look at the number of leisure centers they have last year and look at the number of leisure centers they have this year right this this business is about uh, leisure centers right do you believe the leisure centers have increased from the last year does that mean repair and maintenance cost will go up of the leisure centers do you believe repair and maintenance cost will go up for the leisure centers? Okay, the capital expenditure has increased. The number of leisure centers have increased. Now come to the case study, business background. See which business we are talking about. Look at the business. Okay, we are talking about a business which is Redback. Redback operates 20 sports and leisure centers across the country. Each center has a large gym, a swimming pool, a tennis court, and a badminton court, giving the nature of the business. So is it is it a leisure business which offers you swimming pools and large gyms and, min, and tennis courts and badminton courts? And do you believe they need to be maintained for the members to come and enjoy? Will, will a member likes to come to a bad looking badminton court, a bad looking tennis court, a bad looking swimming pool? Or will a member likes to come to a very bad looking gym where he might get injured? A bad looking swimming pool where he might get injured? So do you believe the nature of business is such that they need a lot of repair and maintenance? Right? Is everyone clear on that? So do you believe the nature of business is is such that they need a lot of repair and maintenance, right? The nature of business is such that they need to buy new equipments. Do you believe they need to buy new equipments for gyms? Do they do you believe they need to regularly invest in the equipments at gyms to keep them up to date for new members to come in? That's wonderful, right? So has has the number of members increased for them? Are the members happy with them? Look, look at the financial information. Look at the number of members. Have the number of members increased from the last year to this year? So are the members happy with the facilities at gym? Are the members happy with the facilities at the swimming pool? Are they happy with the facilities at the tennis court? The number of members are going up. So now can we make a very proper point on the liquidity problems? Looking at the nature of the business, looking at the rise in the number of members, looking at the rise in the number of sports and leisure centers. Now, the, now see realistically, See, if I'm writing a strong answer, I will say there has been a fall 
of 75% over the last year, which is de which demonstrate the company is facing the liquidity problems. I just copy this line. And then I write full stop and I start writing after that the company is facing some liquidity issues. Redback is a leisure company is a leisure company uh, offering gym offering gym and sorry is a leisure company offering multiple services to its members and redback is a leisure company offering multiple service to its member and a business like such and a business like such and sorry and such a business requires a lot of repair and maintenance to keep its facilities up to date for members to enjoy good services for members to enjoy good services such such a business right requires a lot of repair and maintenance to keep its facilities up to date and to enjoy good services which can be which can put pressure on cash flows which can put pressures on cash flows so do we know the reason why the cash has gone down by 75 percent uh, do we believe this this might be because of the nature of the business this might be because of a lot of repair and maintenance to keep its facilities up to date for members to enjoy good services which can put a lot of pressure on cash flows so do you believe uh, the cash flow pressure is because of the nature of business have we connected that with the uh, have we connected that with the case study now and we can tell tell examiner further there has been an increase in capital expenditure there has been an increase in capital expenditure over the last year over the last year which itself puts pressure on cash flows which itself put pressure on cash flows full stop so is cash flow a business objective is cash flow a business objective and is it is it and something putting pressure on a cash flow is is it a business risk something putting pressure on a cash flow is it a business risk do you all agree cash flow is a business objective and a pressure on a cash flow is a business risk uh, can you tell me how much was the rise in the capital expenditure did anyone found the percentage of a rise in the capital expenditure from the last year to this year 60% Okay, do you believe 60% was a rise in the capital expenditure? Okay, that's fine. Further, there has been an increase in the capital expenditure over the last year by 60%, which itself put pressure on cash flows. Now, see how many percentages I brought here 75, 60. Did I use did I use them in isolation, 75 or 60, or did I use them as part of my answer? Right. How many how many uh, sentences I have? How many sentences I have in my answer? Quickly count the sentences, everyone. How many sentences I have in my two marks answer? How many full stops I have? I have one full stop. Then I have a second full stop. Then I have a third full stop. So how many sentences I have? Three sentences. Do, do you believe three sentences is a very long answer? Not at all. It's it's a it's a very nice answer. Let, let me tell you, this is a very nice answer. I, I'm not just self-appraising myself, right? I'm not just self-appraising myself. Right? Look at this. Uh, examiner article, technique article. Can you just read the examiner technique article? Look at this point in front of your screen. Look, look at this here. Just just read this and tell me you understood this and tell me did I wrote a very long answer. Look at this. See examiner is saying for a briefly explained business risk only one mark and for a well explained business risk full marks. So now tell me do my answer look like a well explained answer in front of your screen. 
So is it is it a well explained answer? It is right. So being a well explained answer, do you expect to be rewarded? You cannot write just like this. You cannot just write like this. The weak answer. Look at the weak answer in red and expect two marks never. So. Reconcile. Will you be considering financial information important when you're answering a business risk question? Or will you just ignore financial information? Can a financial information be a source of a business risk? Okay, just just quickly down to other points. We have more 10 more minutes before break. So let's let's do some more exercise. Okay, come back to the case study on red back. And let's read the business background of the red back company. Okay, now right in front we were reading a uh, red back has 20 sports and leisure centers and they're offering swimming pools, tennis and badminton courts. Uh, just just one minute. Uh, I missed one point in my answer and you didn't bother about reminding me. Uh, when I was writing my, my answer, I should have mentioned here and the business requires a lot of repair and maintenance to keep the facilities up to date to enjoy the services, so on and so forth. You can even mention that the number of facilities have increased from 18 to 20. The business requires a lot of repair and maintenance to keep its facilities up to date bracket open number of facilities has also increased from 18 to 20 which itself will increase the repair and repair and maintenance right so you have more facilities this year than the last year it will bring pressure on your repair and maintenance expenses and that will again bring pressure on your cash flows so you can also mention that the number of facilities have increased right we we just missed that point out right okay now come back to the case study Okay, I'm reading uh, from here. Given given the nature of the company, given the nature of the company's operation, Redback has to comply with health and safety regulations set by the National Regulatory Authority, and its facilities are regularly monitored to ensure all regulations are followed and for the company to retain its operating license. Do you believe compliance is a very major risk for Redback? If, if they have a non-compliance problem, will they lose the license? Do you believe the company has to comply with the regulations? And do you believe the license the license is conditional on the basis of the compliance? Now, can we think about future? That what if the company have a non compliance in future? Will that eventually results in losing the license? And do you believe license is the business objective? Do you all agree license is a business objective? And do you believe compliance compliance is a bit non compliance is a business risk? Now every past paper you do December 12th, December 14, December 17 or even December 18. Finding a non compliance risk is very common in business risk because every time this is a very favorite parameter of examiner. No, it's it's not speculation, right? It's given in the case study. The company has to comply with health and safety regulation and and we have to think about risk. In future. Currently, currently is is there any non compliance? No, but in future can there be a non compliance? Yes. So uh, health and safety regulations is a case specific point. How can that be hypothetical? How can that be speculations? Okay, next next point health and safety regulations health and safety regulations. See how you formulate a point. Now when you write under health and safety regulations, you will you will say read back has an exposure red bag has an exposure to compliance risk red bag has an exposure to compliance uh, and red bags has, has an exposure to compliance and they need to follow regulations they need to follow regulations to ensure they their license their license remain operative the license remain operative if there are any non compliances if there are any non compliances in future if there are any non compliances in future by redback it might result in a reputational loss for it might result in reputational loss for the company and moreover 
red back red back may lose its license which eventually brings a question mark which eventually brings a question mark on red back survival as a business survival as a business see you need to write the business risk with if when you are taking future if we're not sure right so we say if when we are sure we never use if right right now look at my point red bag has an exposure to compliance and they need to follow regulations to ensure their license is operative but if there are any non-compliances in future because in present there are no it might result in reputational loss for the business and moreover red bag may lose its license which eventually brings a question mark on red bag survival as a business now look at my length of answer above and look at my length of answer below in the answer above i was using percentages which dragged my answer I use the numbers 18 to 20 number. I use the number 75 percent. I, I use the number 60 percent, which dragged my answer. But still, my answer was wasn't long. It was just a three sentence answer. But downside, my answer is just two sentences, and this two sentences is giving me a good answer. Is is my two sentences ambiguous? Is it an ambiguous answer? Is it or is it not? Is, is two sentence giving me an ambiguous answer? I was getting two and a half marks above, right? And I'm getting two marks here because I'm not using any percentages, right? So my answer above was worth 2.5 marks and my answer below is worth two marks. So are you getting some exercise on business risk? Are you getting some perspective on difference of writing a business risk answer from a situation to situation? Let's Let's do one more exercise before the break. Come back to the case study. OK, come to the next paragraph. The company is not listed and therefore does not need to comply with the local corporate governance regulation. OK, that's wonderful. The company is not listed. The company is not listed. They don't need to comply with the corporate governance regulation. However, the company's chief operating officer and chairman consider it a good practice to have an independent input on the board. So is, is the company voluntarily adopting corporate governance? Do, do the chairman and the chief operating officer consider it to be a good practice to have corporate governance in place and to have independent directors, independent input on the board? So even though it's not legal for them they're still following the corporate governance on a voluntarily basis which is something very very good and there are two non-executive directors in red back one of the non-executive director is a leisure industry expert so one of them is a leisure industry expert okay and the second the second non-executive director is an academic who specializes in organizational behavior and who have written several books on the leisure industry and he has written several books on the leisure industry okay so both the non-executive directors do both non-executive directors have knowledge of the leisure industry do you agree do you disagree do you believe both have knowledge of the leisure industry the non-executive directors right now tell me do you believe for a non-executive director to be independent should they be from the same industry or to have a fresh pair of eyes or to have a fresh pair of eyes should you be from a different industry so that you can be more skeptical you can you can have a fresh pair of eyes if you are from the same industry you might not be very skeptical you you will have knowledge of business right you will have knowledge of business that is a good point but if you are from the same industry you will also have distractions you will be knowing a lot of things when you know lots of things do you do you go deep inside or when you don't have knowledge do you go deep inside which is better you you know the familiarity threat with the external auditor right external auditor do have a familiarity threat when he serves very long when when the external auditor serves very long the external auditor has a familiarity threat so do you not believe that if a non-executive director is from the same industry, he will have a familiarity threat. He knows the industry. Will, will it distract his work? 
so uh, if you if if you read the literature of non executive directors uh, having a non executive director from the same industry have its advantages but also have its disadvantages so currently uh, this company is adopting corporate governance on a voluntarily basis which is good they have appointed two non executive directors which is very good but both non executive directors are from the same industry which brings a question mark on their independence somehow just keep this point on hold and come to the next paragraph here redback has a small internal audit department but they don't have an audit committee now if redback does not have an audit committee do you believe in the absence of the audit committee the internal audit department is reporting to a finance director do you believe if the internal audit department reports to the finance director will it compromise the independence of the internal audit department agree or disagree now i will make one point they have an internal audit department but that is small and who reports to the finance director and they don't even have an audit committee despite the fact they have two non executive directors despite the fact they are following the corporate governance on a voluntarily basis then why don't they have an audit committee when they are following corporate governance on a voluntarily basis now i will combine these two and make a point see how how would i formulate this into a business risk okay next point uh, corporate governance i simply put a heading corporate governance so my assessor knows which point am i addressing corporate governance and under the heading of the corporate governance i'll write my answer i'll say it is a good practice it is a good practice of redback see i'm appreciating first it is a good practice of redback to voluntarily adopt best practices of corporate governance best practices of corporate governance it is a good practice of redback to voluntarily adopt the best practices of corporate governance comma however however the companies however the internal audit department seems not to be independent the internal audit department seems not to be independent as they report to finance director this will limit the scope and function of internal audit department and any weaknesses or issues in the internal controls at redback at redback will not be identified properly will not be identified properly or or management will not take timely actions even the in action right even the in action is a business risk right i i read the definition with all of you at the beginning of the class today that even a in action is a business risk so this will limit the scope and function of the internal audit department and any weaknesses or issues in the internal control at redback will not be identified properly because the internal auditor is not independent or management will not take timely actions uh, on the suggestions of the internal auditor uh, this uh, this lack of timely actions this lack of timely actions this lack of timely actions can cause business inefficiencies can cause business inefficiencies can cause business inefficiencies this lack of timely actions can cause business inefficiencies for redback i hope you all understand that controls are good controls are important for every business if controls are working good it improves the efficiency of the business but if controls are not working good and the problems in controls are not addressed on a timely basis it do leads to business inefficiencies so i hope you all realize that as accountants as acca students that controls add efficiency to business proper controls add efficiencies to business but if controls are not working properly or the problems in controls are not rectified on a timely basis it do leads to business inefficiencies so do you believe business inefficiencies is a business risk which can affect which can affect redback company do you all agree 
So yes, you can even think about fraud. You can even think about fraud. You can even think about uh, the reputation of the company. So did did I started with appraising the company in the first line? Did I appraise the company in the first line and then criticized? Because the company was doing something good, right? The company was doing something good. I should appreciate the company. But then I was skeptical that even though they're adopting corporate governance on a voluntarily basis, even though they're adopting corporate governance on a voluntarily basis, they, they seems to have an internal audit department which is reporting to the finance director, which is wrong. This will limit the internal auditor independence. So they, they should have an audit committee, right? When they have two non-executive directors. Should I should I give the mitigation to the examiner? Should I tell examiner the mitigation that this should have an audit committee? Will I get any marks for writing the mitigation? No, so am I addressing the issue or am I addressing the mitigation here? So this issue will give me two marks. So see how many marks have I got out of my eight marks? Technically two plus two is four and two and a half is six and a half. So is everyone getting a sense of how you pick issues and write issues? Please ensure you complete the answer on business risk. Please ensure you know the marking scheme on business risk. Please ensure you read the article on business risk and please ensure that when you raise the points in a business risk answer, you reconcile your points with the examiner pointers. I hope you can continue from this point onwards uh, on the on the track. I guided you. You will write your answer first. You will compare your pointers with the examiner pointers and you will then look at the criticism. Right. The business risk should have headings, right? Corporate governance is the first is the heading. Health and safety is the heading through which the examiner can identify which area you're writing upon. OK, the heading of this liquidity paragraph can be uh, the cash flows. The cash, the cash flow can be the heading, right? Or the cash. Only the cash because the cash it was the area we were addressing, right? Yes, uh, Zed, you can uh, you can uh, you can relate that uh, NED from the same industry uh, lacking independence and lacking independence to uh, business risk. That's wonderful. Uh, I will be sharing the word document in front of your screen on the WhatsApp group. Don't be worried about it. So just before I give you the break, do tell me. Uh, have you been able to learn something in the first part of the class today? Have you got some <coughs> better understanding of business risk? Have you got some clarity on business risk? So, uh, what what was the most uh, what was the most amazing thing you got in the last ninety minutes in terms of business risk? Please, your quick suggestions, quick answers. Sorry, what was the most amazing thing you got in the last ninety minutes? Okay. The marking scheme was very useful. OK, the writing techniques was useful. OK, that's good. OK, connection with the case linking the financials to business risk. OK, that's good. The self appraising part you should self appraise. OK, the extra half a mark, the extra half a mark. OK, so that means you learned something, right? So 90 minutes into the webinar, uh, do you believe this was a waste of time or did you believe this was really, uh, really, really important that you took this live webinar today and you got some insights about uh, how you should be going about it. OK, so if you have a very good looking first part, the second part would be much better because we will be focusing on the risk of material misstatement and I will be focusing on the marking scheme of the risk of material misstatement because the risk of material misstatement is an area which I've covered several times in my past webinars. So I probably will just give you some examples will not be solving the complete question, but I'll give you examples to guide you the mistakes the student do in a ROM answer and I will be giving you the marking scheme. So the second part of the session will also be very, very important, right? So I'm leaving you with the screen in front. So if you want to copy something down, you can and we're taking a break for approximately 15 minutes. I'll resume back at 1025 1025 p.m. and we'll spend the last 65 minutes on risk of material misstatement, right? Uh, please do drop your feedback about the session today, uh, which I will just be monitoring during the course of my break. Uh, overall feedback about the session today, right? Uh, I would be very much interested in knowing the feedback. So please ensure that you uh, drop your feedbacks and we're going off to a break for 15 minutes and we'll resume back at 1025, right? So I'm just putting that on the screen. We're having a break till 10. 25 p.
pm the pakistan standard time right and we'll resume back Okay, I'm just muting myself, right? Please come back in the class at 10.25 p.m.
Okay, welcome back uh, everyone after the break. Uh, we are into the day two of the advanced audit and assurance a practice to pass webinar for exams in December 2020. And we just focused on business risk prior to the break. And now post break, I am focusing on the risk of material misstatement. Now, just before I proceed further, can you all hear me? And can you see the screen in front of you, the day two business risk and ROM? OK, so if all of you can hear me and you can see the screen in front of you, which is the PowerPoint presentation. So let's start on with the proceeding of the second and the last part of the day two, and let's focus on risk of material misstatement. <laughs> now, please ensure that you complete all the business risk uh, questions uh, in the way it has been guided to you. And please do a self appraisal of your answer so that you have an ability of writing a good business risk answer. Also, please see my previous webinar on business risk. My previous webinar on business risk was in December 18. The hyperlink of that is given to you. So you can utilize this webinar as well as the previous webinar so that you gain confidence on the business risk. Now moving towards the next agenda the risk of material misstatement, right? And again, we need to formulate the same things for the risk of material misstatement uh, from an examination perspective. So let's let's start on with the risk of material misstatement, which is the objective two of the day two. I just need to uh, spell some important things. Uh, I will not be practicing on ROM because I have practiced that a lot in my March 20 webinar and even in my previous webinars as well. I just want to give you some extra knowledge uh, which can be a really, really add on, really important add on for all of you. So the objective now is the risk of material misstatement or something also known as an audit risk. <clears throat> OK, now looking at this, uh, the very first thing you should be looking at again, just like the business risk is the source of learning. Uh, can there be a source of learning on risk of material misstatement and audit risk? Uh, the very important thing is the marking scheme because the marking scheme is a bit complex and you need to understand that it's not as simple as a business risk marking scheme. And then more importantly, uh, something uh, yesterday from day one in the day one when we were looking at the March 2020 examiner report, and we were looking at the criticism of the examiner in the day one yesterday. Examiner was very much concerned about speculative risk versus uh, case specific risk. So I need to do an exercise on that as well so we can overcome the criticism of the examiner in the March 2020 report because the examiner was very much concerned that students tried a lot of speculative risk rather than case business specific risk when they are writing a risk of material misstatement answer. So this is how we should be going about it and then formulating a good answer. Formulating a good answer. I will just show you some examples of that. Show examples, right? Okay, let's work on it. Now, obvious, obviously the source of learning is the exam technique article, which is part two which we were just reading prior to the break. The same article covers the risk. Of material misstatement and same articles covers the audit risk. So you can read the same article again, but the marking scheme. I'm just guiding you off that. Let's start the journey. Now the most latest paper we have on audit risk. Published. Uh, is the March 2020 paper. So we will utilize the March 2020 paper to analyze the marking scheme for audit risk and the same marking scheme is for ROM. So let's analyze the marking scheme from the very latest paper. Do we have any other paper besides March 20? No. Uh, can we evaluate the marking scheme from another paper? No, we just have a March 20 paper, the most updated one. <clears throat> so let's use this marking scheme from March 20. This will be the marking scheme for both audit risk and risk of material misstatement, right? So you can use this marking scheme for both audit risk and risk of material misstatement. Let's let's carefully evaluate the marking scheme. OK, now if I take you to the March 2020 answers right in front of your screen, you can see the March 2020 answers as we saw the December 18 answers prior to the break and you go to the last pages. 
of these answers like the page number 13 rather page number 12 and on the page number 12 you can see the marking scheme of the march 2020 paper and we are looking into it okay now this is the most updated marking scheme march 2020 right and we are looking at the audit risk evaluation okay i will give you one minute to read it can you just quickly read the marking scheme for audit risk or something known as risk of material misstatement just in one minute and tell me you read it so i can do an analysis of that and again under the marking scheme the examiner is giving the pointers of audit risk which you can do as a self appraisal you can reconcile your pointers with the examiner but just read the marking scheme and tell me whether you read it and the more important thing is yeah, that you understood it that is more important okay waiting for more messages on you have read it <clears throat> okay that's good okay let's let's do an analysis of this marking scheme <coughs> sorry which is the most latest one okay i'm just copying this marking scheme from here and i'm taking the marking scheme from here to my word file and we'll do a proper analysis and conclude on it so we can start the next exercise okay just copying this from the paper Okay, now if you just give me one minute so I can just set it up and then start with the analysis. So you have a proper Word file which can be shared with you on the WhatsApp group, right? Okay, now when you look at this analysis here, okay, in the first bullet, the examiner is telling us that when you write an audit risk answer or you write a ROM answer, whatever that is, because both are similar in terms of the marking scheme, up to three marks for each audit risk unless indicated otherwise marks may be awarded for other relevant audit risk not included in the marking guide did we read the same statement in business risk marks may be awarded for other risk not included in the marking guide so if you identify another audit risk not given in the marking guide you will still be getting marks but how many marks up to three marks for each audit risk up to three bucks so one of the marking scheme is up to three bucks number one look at the next one in the next one can you see the word in addition just like the word in addition we saw in business risk can we see the same word in addition here so is it extra extra marks yes in addition half a mark for the relevant trends or calculation which form parts of the evaluation of audit risk is that exactly identical to what we just found in business risk half a mark for the relevant trend which forms part of your answer half a mark extra for the relevant trend or calculations which form part but look at what is written here maximum three marks examiner was not giving you a limit in the business risk but over here the examiner is saying that how many how many additional half a mark you can score just maximum three because the marking the, the in in a question when you're finding an audit risk or in a question when you're finding a rom there are so many roms there are so many audit risk right so you might find so many percentages because audit risk connects with numbers right from connects with numbers so you might find so many percentages but the examiner is limiting you half a mark for a relevant trend or half a mark for a relevant calculation up to maximum of how many marks up to a maximum of three marks so how many calculations how many calculations or trends can be identified if we divide three by one and a half, three by half six so maximum amount of trends or calculations I can show in my complete answer is how many? Six, but again, for a student, six is a very big number here, right? Most of the time, the students are least bothered about finding trends. Most of the time, the students are least bothered about finding a calculation. So if you find a trend, if you find a calculation in your audit risk answer or in your ROM answer, <clears throat> will you get an extra half a mark for that? Will you get an extra half a mark for that? Yes, but how many? How many maximum? I think uh, 
a strong student will reach three, but the weak students are least bothered about half a mark. They never know about half a mark. I hope a lot of lot of you must have got to know this half a mark for the first time. That in addition, a half a mark. And then the examiner is saying materiality calculation should be awarded one mark each up to a maximum of four. Materiality calculations will be awarded one mark each up to a maximum of four. So what is the maximum gap for materiality marks? Four. How many materialities can we calculate in total? <coughs> Everyone. How many materialities can we calculate in total? Four. Because one mark per materiality to a maximum of four. Can we calculate five materialities? Six, seven? Will the examiner give us five, six, seven marks? No. Examiner will maximum give us four marks, right? Now, is the examiner saying in addition one mark? Look at the bullet number three. In the bullet number three, is the examiner saying in addition one mark? No. Can you see in addition in the bullet number two? But is the examiner using the word in addition in the bullet number three? No, that means that materiality marks are included within the three marks, right? Materiality marks are included within the three marks. Now, if you break the three marks, if you break the three marks per audit risk, per audit risk, or per risk of material misstatement, per risk of material misstatement, per risk of material misstatement, when you break this, there is one mark for materiality. When you when you determine the materiality in the exam paper and when you comment on the materiality and you comment on the materiality, you will get. One mark, then there is one mark. In the three marks for the accounting treatment for the accounting treatment if you comment on the accounting treatment comment on the accounting treatment because you know that the the risk of a deal misstatement question is uh, flooded with accounting treatments right and then the one mark is for the risk and impact risk and impact together is one mark now I will just be telling you what is risk and what is impact, but one mark for risk and impact together. That is a breakup of three marks. So when will you get three marks? When you when you write materiality, when you write an accounting treatment, when you write a risk and impact together. Now this this will worth three marks. But suppose you are writing a business. Suppose you are writing an audit risk, uh, which does not have a materiality which not necessarily right every time you have materiality. One mark per calculation. Suppose you're writing a business. Uh, you're writing an audit risk which does not have a materiality. Will you be getting uh, three marks then? Right, take take some examples. Take take an example and tell me quickly, right? Take, take an example and be quick. Uh, I, I'm making a table quickly. And in the table, let's write many risk, right? Uh, in the table, let's write some risk here. Number one, the company does not have an internal audit department. Will this statement give you two marks or three marks when you convert this to an audit risk? The company does not have an internal audit department. I hope you are all capable of identifying the audit risk in the company does not have an internal audit department. Okay, will it fetch you two marks? Will it fetch you three marks? Two, three. Okay, very good answers. This will give you two. Yes, two marks. Move next. Share based payment expense is not recognized. Share based payment expense is not recognized. How will you get three? Is there a value given for expense? How can you find the materiality of the share based payment expense? Is, is the value given? Most of you were saying three is the value given. Only two marks, right? No value given. No value given. No value given. The work in progress was valued. The work in progress was valued 
at dollar 22 million now now can you get three bucks yes because you have a value you have an accounting treatment of a work in progress okay now just just be quick here right i just need to find a very good solution here let me add some rows here okay we got the first three marks right we cop did did we comment it on the materiality for 22 marks did we comment it on the materiality here commented on materiality and how many marks we have for materiality maximum maximum how many marks we have for materiality four okay move to the next point <clears throat> in the next point uh there is a point government grant a government grant of dollar 10 million was taken how many marks three very good do we have a comment on the materiality just one minute right sorry comment on the materiality comment on materiality and you will have the same answer here yes good okay then there is another point a loan of dollar 10 million was taken to a uh, loan of 10 million dollar was taken for five years so is there is there a value of loan and can you think about the accounting treatment of loan or can you think about the classification of loan into current liabilities and non-current liabilities right so do we have a comment on materiality here yes and move on okay the next point suppose there is a point uh during the year the company revalued its assets the company revalued its asset resulting in a revaluation surplus resulting in a revaluation surplus resulting in a revaluation surplus of dollar 15 million <coughs> okay we get another three marks okay then there is another point in the same exam paper suppose in the same exam paper there is another point a defer tax asset was recognized at dollar five million now how many marks will you get three or two look at the table very carefully look at the table very carefully have you exhaust have you exhausted your four marks on materiality yes or no have you exhausted your four marks on materiality everyone look at this look at this suppose this is one question right have you exhausted your marks so if you if you even calculate the materiality of 5 million if you even calculate the materiality of 5 million how many marks will you be getting here just two just two because materiality marks are exhausted because materiality marks are exhausted because materiality marks are exhausted so are you getting what what does that mean one mark per materiality to a maximum of four is everyone becoming clear on that is everyone becoming clear on that so suppose you're reading a case study right when you're reading the case study uh the and you comment on the materiality one you comment on the materiality two you comment on the materiality three you comment on the materiality four the next time you find a value will that value give you three marks no that value will not give you three marks right so how many comments on materiality you can do in the full question just four now whether you do it on the uh, whether you do it on the four here or you skip one of them and you do it on different decks it's totally up to you. I, I was just going in the order, right? So I just commented on the first four and I skipped the fifth one. So can there be a two marks risk? Can there be a three marks risk? Is everyone clear on that? Right? <laughs> okay, and finally, the examiner was telling us, uh, in addition, half a mark, half a mark for relevant trend or calculation relevant trend or calculation up to maximum of three up to maximum of three right so tell me finally when you are writing the audit risk when you're writing the audit risk or when you are writing the risk of material misstatement right 
can there be a can there be an audit risk of 3.5 marks the one the one which involves the one which involves materiality treatment risk and impact plus plus a relevant trend plus a relevant trend or a calculation can can this be a possibility when you're reading the case study can this be a possibility of getting a risk which involves three and a half marks everyone so is 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 half a mark in addition to three or is half a mark included in three tell me is half a mark included in three or is it addition to three what was the examiner telling definitely it was in addition and the one mark of materiality the one mark of materiality was it included in three or was it in addition it was included very very good okay can can there be a can there be a risk of three marks have i given you the three marks risk the one which involves the m the one which involves the m the the t the the r the i right Okay, can can there be a 2.5 marks risk? The one which does not have M, but have other factors, but have other factors plus a relevant trend, plus a relevant trend or a calculation. Can that be a possibility, everyone? Can <coughs> are these probabilities right? I'm just working on the probabilities, right? I'm just working on the probabilities. Okay, can there be a two marks risk? Can there be a two marks risk? Right, the, the one without materiality, right? Or relevant trend. Just like this one, the company does not have an internal audit department. No accounting treatments, right? No accounting treatments. So in when you are reading an audit risk answer when you are planning an audit risk answer right can you think about risk which can give you three and a half marks can you think about risk which gives you three marks can you give about think about risk which gives you two and a half marks can you think about risk which gives you two right so is is there a is there a diversified marking scheme when it comes to audit risk is everyone clear on that so will this help you in planning your answer how much audit risk to write how much rom to write right right a two and a half marks risk can be any risk in the exam paper right which which for which has a relevant trend but does not have a materiality right so any risk you identify in an exam paper where you can quote a number right just like a business risk we were writing we wrote a business risk for two and a half marks because we quoted a number in that business risk Okay, I hope you're all clear on the marking scheme, right? I'm just moving one step above the marking scheme now, and I just want to give you some examples in the context of the examiner criticism. Okay, just just come to March 2020 paper. I want to drill something with you. Please listen to me carefully, right? March 2020. <coughs> I'll be sharing this word file with you, right? Don't don't be worried about it. March 2020. I'm just taking it as an exemplar, uh, as an exemplar versus examiner criticism versus examiner criticism. <clears throat> okay. Now I'm showing you one thing, right, from the March 2020 paper. Uh, let's see where is the March 2020 paper. Okay, the March 2020 paper right in front of your screen, everyone. Right, you go down and you come to the question number one. And in the question number one, this was the paper we were using yesterday, right? And the examiner was very critical of the students writing very wrong risk. Okay, look at this question paper in front. Uh, it asks us to evaluate the audit risk and the marks are 24. Now we know in these 24 marks, there might be some audit risk worth three marks, three and a half marks. There might be some audit risk worth two and a half marks, two marks. So it's not like that you say, okay, 24 marks divided by two, 12. No. Do you think if you are writing 12 audit risk, that's a lot? If one student divides 24 with two, 
and finds the answer 12 and you're writing 12 audit risk do tell me are you writing too much audit risk in the exam paper am i right am i right in that perspective okay that's good right now move on 24 marks of audit risk and you go down the case study i, I want to address one audit risk with you right uh Okay, look at this. Can you all see the intangible asset goodwill? Here. Everyone. Uh, Rizwana Raza, we should be writing 12 audit risk. Is that right answer? How can we write 12 audit risk? Is, is, is the marking scheme two marks per audit risk? Will we be dividing 24 marks with two? What I was guiding you in the last 15 minutes. Do you believe you are attempting a question on business risk where you divide 24 marks with two? Because in 24 marks, you will have three marks. In 24 marks, you will have three and a half marks. In 24 marks, you will have two and a half marks. So ideally, you need to write less than 12 risk. Okay, can you all see the note number three in front of your screen, intangible assets, goodwill? Can you see the value of the goodwill in the last year 135 and can you see the value of the goodwill this year 135 right so the same value right the same value coming in this year and the same value coming in the last year 135 135 okay now let's look at the note number note number three now when you look at the note number three see what is the management telling us in the note number three in the note number three the management is telling us something very very important can you just read this note number three quickly in one minute in front of your screen this note number three and remember the goodwill value was the same as of the last year just just read this note number three and tell me you read it <coughs> okay are we speaking of a group are we speaking of a group Yes, we are speaking of a group, right? Uh, so group consists of many subsidiaries, right? And do you believe this goodwill, this goodwill uh, of 135 million consists of goodwill uh, arising on the acquisition of many subsidiaries, 135 million? So the 135 million might be a goodwill of many subsidiaries, right? Which the group have. So tell me, has the group tested goodwill for impairment? Have they, have they not? Is the question telling you something positive here or something negative here? Right now, just just look what happens to you as students in exam hall. I'm just taking this line from here. And I want to do one very good analysis here. OK, just take this line from the examiner question. I pasted it here. Just give me one minute to make it right. OK, this is the note number three note number three from the question paper March 2020 and I just pushed uh, post it here right now we know that the goodwill value has remained same and it says the goodwill is tested annually for impairment in accordance with IES 36 and due to the strong performance of the group no impairment has been recognized so have they tested impairment yes they have but at, <coughs> at the end of the testing at the end of the testing they have concluded there is no need of an impairment okay just quickly agree with me has has the group reviewed uh, the goodwill for impairment have the good have the group reviewed the goodwill for impairment yes but at the end of the impairment have they concluded there is no need of impairment or at the end of the review have they concluded there is no need of impairment right so has the good has the group done the right accounting treatment by reviewing the goodwill for impairment The 
this criticism. I hope you remember uh, we were reading this criticism of the examiner yesterday. OK, I, I hope all of you can hear me, right? <coughs> OK, that's great. I, I hope you remember this criticism of the examiner uh, we were discussing yesterday. Examiner was telling us a further area that demonstrated a lack of application to the scenario surrounded the impairment of the goodwill performed by the group on an annual basis. A number of candidates. Discussed the journal treatment of goodwill that is to be tested for impairment on an annual basis and that the management had not tested impairment and therefore concluding on the financial statement impact that the goodwill is overstated. Do tell me. Is this right? Examiner saying you are wrong. A number of candidates discussed the journal treatment of goodwill. That it is to be tested for impairment on an annual basis. Okay. Has the management tested it for impairment? Yes. Have they concluded there is no need for impairment? Yes. Then is, is this a valid answer? Is this a valid answer? Examiner is saying no, this is not a valid answer. Then you come to the next point. It says the question. The question clearly referred to the group correctly performing the annual impairment review. Right, the question clearly. Referred to the group correctly performing the annual impairment review, but had not recognized impairment due to strong performance, right? Look at the last point. The key issue here was the indicator of impairment within the foreign subsidiary and the impact this would have on the impairment review. Now, because you read the full question before you attempt the answer, even though the group is telling us there is a strong performance, there is one foreign subsidiary which is loss making. And that was the key issue. Now see, how would you go about this question? Just one minute. OK, now suppose <coughs> there is a weak student, right? And a weak student who is obsessed with ice ice 36 starts the answer. Goodwill. Is. Goodwill of dollar 135 million. Is a fill in the blank. Percent of the total assets. A fill in the blank percent of the total assets, right? This is how we start the answer, right? OK, goodwill of 135 million dollar is a fill in the blank percentage of the total assets for a stop. Thus material to the financial statements to the financial statements. OK, uh, am I audible to all of you? Can you all hear me? OK, that's great. OK, a goodwill of 135 million dollar is a fill in the blank percentage of the total assets, whatever that is from the exam paper. Thus material to the financial statement for a stop. Then you say goodwill. Should be annually reviewed for impairment. Goodwill should be annually reviewed for impairment. Goodwill should be annually reviewed for impairment and. As no impairment review. This is I'm writing the wrong answer, right? Which the examiner is criticizing. And as no impairment review. Has been performed. Has been performed on goodwill. The goodwill is overstated. <clears throat> okay, is, is there any distortion in my audio? Because I believe my audio is very clear. If anyone is having any distortion, you please need to log out of the webinar and log in. So any anyone who's having a distortion in my voice, you need to log out and log in because my voice is clear to the majority of the students. And as no impairment review has been performed on goodwill, the goodwill is overstated. And you come happily out of the exam hall expecting that I will get one mark for materiality. I will get one mark for the accounting treatment. I will get one mark for the accounting treatment. I will get another one mark for the risk and the impact. And I'm so happy that the examiner will give me Right, because you, you are very definite, right? You're saying goodwill should be annually reviewed for impairment when the examiner is saying it has been 
and no impairment review has been performed when the examiner is telling us that it has been performed so the goodwill is overstated or there is another student who starts this way and he's a more brilliant student who just studied the who just studied the SPR paper he says a goodwill of a 135 million dollar uh, is a fill in the blank percent of the total assets thus material to the financial statement goodwill should be annually reviewed for impairment and as goodwill should be annually reviewed for impairment full stop uh, impairment should be recognized impairment should be recognized when there is an indicator of impairment when there is an indicator of impairment and when the carrying amount and when the carrying amount exceeds the recoverable amount full stop the recoverable <laughs> recoverable amount is the higher of value in use or the fair value less cost to sell full stop and you come finally to as no impairment review has been performed the goodwill is overstated now have you wrote a journal accounting treatment which is not linked to a case study tell me these are both examples of weak answers these are both examples of weak answer this or this because you didn't connect it to the case study just just visualize both the answers everyone you you can read the note number here which is telling us that the goodwill has been reviewed for impairment and the impairment review has been performed and the group is saying that due to strong performance there is no need to recognize any impairment you read that now look at the first answer look at the second answer the student in the second answer even dragged the treatment because he was so obsessed with giving spr recently he just passed SBR in September exams and he's appearing for AAA in the December exams. Useless answers. Now look at the strong answer. The student who's writing the strong answer is the one who read the full case study, who read the full case and, and is very alert in exam hall. He starts in the same manner. Goodwill is material to the financial statement no doubt about that you start with the same statement copy paste but after the full stop he says <clears throat> it is good to it is good that the group has reviewed goodwill for impairment it is good that the group has reviewed goodwill for impairment and this is the right accounting treatment you're appreciating the, <coughs> the group. It is good that the group has reviewed goodwill for impairment, and this is the right accounting treatment. However, the stance of the group, the stance of the group that the group had a strong performance, the group had a strong performance, and there is no need to recognize impairment is wrong because one of the foreign subsidiary one of the foreign subsidiary which is part of the group right one of the foreign subsidiary is loss making this year which is an indicator for review which is an indicator for review now, how do how do you know there is a loss making subsidiary which is an indicator for review now see am i writing in the context of the case if i take you back to the case study march 20 paper where you read about goodwill and you move down to the exhibit number four when you come to the exhibit number four you will read in the exhibit number four that there is one subsidiary which you recently acquired look at this read read about the subsidiary it, it tells us that there is a subsidiary in the group which is projected to make a loss this year now if you have a subsidiary which is projected to make a loss this year do you all believe this is a indicator of 
and impairment review. Do you all believe we should recognize impairment of the goodwill pertaining to this particular subsidiary? So when you have a loss making subsidiary, see how you're connecting the case and there is no need to recognize an impairment is wrong because 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 there is a foreign subsidiary because there is a foreign subsidiary and there is no need to recognize an impairment is wrong because there is a foreign subsidiary which is loss making this year which is loss making this year which is an indicator for which is an indicator for impairment thus management has wrongly concluded management has wrongly concluded of on no need of impairment on no need of impairment and thus <coughs> and thus the goodwill is overstated now see this answer did you connected this answer with that you first appreciated this is good that the group has reviewed it is good then you said that the stance of the group that there is a strong performance and there is no need to recognize the impairment is wrong so you criticize the stance and then you connected the stance with a foreign subsidiary which is loss making this year and then you thought because there is a subsidiary which is loss making that means the goodwill is overstated now tell me which is a better answer writing a journal treatment of impairment recoverable amount value in use and fair value and carrying amount exceeds the recoverable amount writing the journal impairment or writing impairment in the context of the case study which is the wonderful answer out of the three you, you saw on the screen everyone tell me are you getting are you getting some uh, mind opener here are you getting the mind opener because a lot of time all of you likes to write journal accounting treatment a lot of time all of you likes to write journal accounting treatment and you're least bothered about writing an accounting treatment which is connected to a case study <coughs> which is connected to a case study So do, it, does my answer consist of impairment accounting treatment in the context of the case study? So how much is this answer worth three marks? I don't have any percentages here, right? So this is just a three marks answer. So now now look, look at the examiner criticism everyone. Look at this examiner criticism we, we read yesterday. Just just look at this examiner criticism now fully just noting the journal accounting treatment with no specific conversion to the case are you getting this point everyone so will you be thoughtful of writing a relevant accounting treatment which is in context of the case study rather than just producing a journal accounting treatment right look look at look at a second example from the same paper march 20. march 20 come back to this paper Okay, can you look at the note number two? Here and other intangible assets and this time the intangible asset is the license. Can you see the license last year was 420 and license this year <coughs> is 580. So is, is there a note number for the license? Should we read the note number? Right. Now when you look at the note number for the license. Read the note number two. Just just read the note number two. Tell me what is what is the problem here? I'm giving you one minute for reading the note number two on the on the license. Just just read the note number two. OK, so do they have license for a fixed period of time? And when they have license for a fixed period of time, should they amortize the license over the useful life? 
Now, some of the licenses have life of three years. Some of them have life of five years. Can we just amortize all licenses on five years? Or should we amortize? Should we amortize some on three and some on five? So have we amortized all the licenses on five years? Now, if you amortize all the licenses on five years, will it reduce the amortization expense or will it increase the amortization expense? If you amortize all the licenses on five years, will it increase the amortization expense or reduce? You're all accountants, right? Ramiz, you are an accountant. Decrease. When when you divide the amortize when you divide it by five years, it will reduce the amortization expense, right? Not increase. So is, is that a risk of management bias that the management is trying to reduce the amortization expense and increase the profit? Is the management using it as an incentive to increase the profit? So what is wrong here? License. Do we know the cost of the license 580? Can we find the materiality of 580? Can we find can we find the materiality of 580? So when when you're writing this point, the note number two in exam, just just be watchful. When you're writing the note number two, you will first start with licenses. <coughs> licenses of dollar 580 million is a fill in the blank percentage of the total assets. Is a fill in the blank percentage of the total assets. <coughs> Thus, material to the financial statement. You got your first mark. Bracket close. Now, after this line, look at a weak student, and again look at a strong student. So you know how to adapt. A weak student after the line number one. The line number one will remain the same, right? The line number one will remain the same for a weak student and for a strong student. But how will the weak and strong student differ? The weak student will write an answer. The intangible assets. Should be recognized when and you write the recognition of the intangible asset you continue. Blah 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 whatever that is right full stop. OK, the intangible asset should be recognized when something happens right full stop after the full stop asset uh, after the full stop you write. If the intangible assets have a finite life. They should be amortized. They should be amortized over useful life. And if the intangible assets have infinite life, they should be reviewed for impairment. Now tell me, look at this so far, so forth. <coughs> Am I writing journal accounting treatment? Just telling how to recognize an intangible asset. Just telling there is an there there might be an intangible asset with a finite life. Just telling there is there can be an intangible asset with a infinite life. Right? So Am I just writing a journal accounting treatment which has no link to the license given in the case study, which has no link to the useful life of the license? Now the examiner is telling you the license has a useful life, a particular useful life. So why telling examiner a finite and infinite? And the strong student will save time and the strong student will say quickly, the license of $580 million is a fill in the blank percentage of the total assets and thus material to the financial statements full stop and he comes directly to the point. The, the policy of amortization, the policy of amortization of licenses is wrong because each license should be amortized. Each license should be amortized over its useful over its useful life and the management and the management cannot assume a five year basis as relevant a five year basis for amortizing all licenses as relevant amortizing all licenses as relevant full stop if all licenses if all licenses are amortized over five year 
basis, it will reduce the amortization expense. It will reduce the amortization expense. And this can be used as a, this can be used as a technique for management buys to window dress the financial statements to window dress the financial statements. Thus, due to wrong amortization policy, thus due to wrong amortization policy, comma, the amortization expense is understated and the and the licenses as an intangible asset are overstated. Now tell me, did I wrote an answer which was more connected to the policy of amortization, which was case specific. Look at this answer and look at the answer in yellow where you were just writing a journal accounting treatment. I, I hope you get some sense out of writing journal accounting treatments, something I even hate and something even the examiner hate. Journal accounting treatments. And you wrote learn accounting treatments. Students are so happy wrote learning accounting treatments. They, they asked the tutor, do, do you have summaries of the accounting standards? from where I can revise the accounting standards because because you want to rote learn the accounting standards. <clears throat> now tell me which way is better. Should you adapt? Should you adapt the accounting treatment in context of the case study to make a brilliant answer? Are you getting some perspective from the note number two and the note number three, which I just drafted in front of you in the life class? Are you getting some sense? Has it been an eye opener for you? Note number two and note number three. Has it been an eye opener between how a weak student writes an answer and how a strong student writes an answer? Has it given you something? Will you think that way? You still have five weeks before exam. I hope you think that way. So what what is the key message here? What is the key learning? The key learning here is which I keep focusing on every time in my webinar is number one. Adapt the accounting treatment adapt the accounting treatment to the case <coughs> don't reproduce don't reproduce the rote learn accounting treatment don't reproduce the rote learn accounting treatment don't reproduce the rote learn accounting treatment right don't reproduce the rote learn accounting treatment Adapt to adapt to the case adapt to the case. I've given you two examples of adaption, right? One on impairment one on intangible assets. I hope you can learn from that. So is everyone clear on the marking scheme of ROM? Is everyone clear of how you get marks on ROM? The the capping the capping of the materiality the marks are capped for materiality. Is everyone clear about you can get an additional half a mark for any calculations used in your answer? <coughs> right, so just few last aspects to cover before I wind up my day two today. Um, please ensure that you read the examiner article, uh, which is very, very important, which is exam technique article, which I was just reading for business risk today and Please ensure that look at this March 2020 paper. Can you see in this March 2020 paper? The examiner has given you the pointers for audit risk. Look at this. So when you write your answer for March 2020 paper, will you compare your answer first with the pointers of the examiner? And if 50% or more pointers matches, that's wonderful and will give you confidence that your thinking and the examiner thinking is reconciling and that will boost your confidence, right? And yes, absolutely. There is no need to refer to accounting standards, right? No names and numbers of accounting standards, right? You, you can just see that from the examiner article here. If I just take you to the exam technique article. Page number five. Okay, page number five. Just just read this point here. Everyone. I'm giving you one minute. Just just read this point. 
there is no marks for quoting the accounting standard, right? There is no mark for referencing to the accounting standard. Just just read what the blue box in front of your screen quickly. Everyone. No, you, you cannot just write initially the journal treatment and then connect to the case. Never you 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 start your answer with a case specific treatment uh, Abuza. You cannot just waste time first. You write the journal treatment and then you adapt the treatment to the case study that that's a waste of time, right? Yes, the pointers are headings, right? Basically the pointers are headings. So is everyone read it? So is the examiner saying is there any marks for reference number of the accounting standard name of the accounting standard? Will the examiner give you any marks for the name and reference of the accounting standard? I, I hope all of you have read the blue box in front of your screen. Right and one very important thing where I need to focus on. I, I just guided you. That when you're getting three marks. When you're getting a three marks on audit risk, right? Or when you're getting a three marks on uh the uh risk of material in a statement right right you get one mark for materiality right you get one mark for the treatment right and you get one mark for risk and impact the students don't bifurcate between risk and impact and they take half a mark materiality treatment risk and impact let me let me demonstrate that look look at the answer i wrote here on the amortization right just just let me copy this answer on amortization here and just let me bring the materiality for the amortization license sorry <laughs> okay this is my answer right Okay, now be very critical. Risk and impact. We're just spending some time on risk and impact before we end the session. The first line, the first line is giving you how many marks? One. Okay, that is the first line. Yellow materiality. The materiality yellow. One mark. Treatment. The policy of amortization of license is wrong because the license should be amortized over the useful life, and the management cannot assume a five-year basis for amortizing license, and the license should be. Uh, Full stop. This is all the accounting treatment life. This is all the accounting treatment. This is all the accounting treatment. Let's put the accounting treatment in blue. This is the accounting treatment blue. Risk and impact risk and impact. Due to wrong amortization policy, what is the risk? This is the risk wrong amortization policy. So what is the risk? The risk is the wrong amortization policy. And what is the impact? The impact is expense is understated. This is the impact, right? And the intang and the assets are overstated. And the assets are overstated. This is the impact. You need to write the risk and the impact. You cannot avoid it. If you if you fail to write the risk, you will lose half a mark. If you fail to write an impact, you will lose half a mark. So what what basically are risk? What basically are risk? You're all accountants, right? You're all accountants. You're looking at risk in the accounting treatments. What can we risk in the accounting treatments? Number one, the the risk can be. Uh, a risk of wrong classification, a risk of wrong classification. There can be a risk of wrong valuation. I hope you agree. There can be a risk of wrong. There can be a risk of wrong estimations. Evaluation. Risk of wrong valuation, a risk of wrong estimates. A risk of. Uh, wrong recognition risk of wrong recognition a uh, risk of wrong disclosures risk of wrong disclosures or no disclosures no disclosures or incomplete disclosures incomplete disclosures 
So can, how many risks can be there in an accounting standard? A disclosure, a recognition, a valuation, a classification. Do you all believe these are risks associated with accounting standards? Classifications, valuations, estimates, recognitions, disclosures, presentation, risk of inappropriate presentation. So you need to speak of the risk first, right? The risk of the wrong amortization policy. I, I wrote the risk first, followed by the impact. So please ensure that when you are concluding your answer, you have a risk and you have an impact. So if something is wrongly classified, what is the impact? If something is wrongly valued, what is the impact? If something is wrongly recognized, what is the impact? If something is wrongly disclosed, what is the impact? So will you be thinking about risk and impact in the last last sentence of your answer? To score exactly the one mark? Is everyone becoming clear on the difference between a risk and the impact? So you need to write the risk. Right. OK, so has this session given you some insights today? Uh, we are almost coming to the verge of three hours today. Uh, so has the first session on business risk and the second session on ROM given you some insights, some uh, clarities? Uh, so how has been the session today? Has it been a, has it been a good one? Has it really given you some thought process to think about? Obviously, not everything can be covered in these limitations of webinars. Firstly, these are free of cost webinars. You need to realize that uh, this is a, this is a benefit which ACC of Pakistan is providing you. This is free of cost. You're not incurring any cost for that. So obviously, within every constraint, uh, the tutor is delivering a 15 hour webinar and try to do uh, try to focus on the most important things which could be guided in 15 hours. Right? So I, I hope uh, if any of these questions, any of your question has been unaddressed, you can still uh, WhatsApp the tutor and the tutor will find time to reply to your queries uh, within a day or two or might be two or three days depends, right? Because currently I'm very busy with the webinars. I will be getting free on Saturday and after that I probably will get time to reply to your messages, right? But I hope the WhatsApp groups have been created and I will be sharing this word file in the WhatsApp group. Uh, we have a very, very important day tomorrow, uh, which is about uh, ethical, professional and quality control issues. Even though I've covered this topic many times, but I will be focusing on quality control tomorrow a lot because I believe uh, I need to give students a very proper clarity on quality control issues uh, because I have focused a lot on ethical and professional issues in my previous webinar. So I will be looking at ethical, professional and quality control issues in a very different manner tomorrow. So please do join the day three tomorrow, uh, which will be very, very important to give you insights about ethical, professional and quality control issues, right? So. Uh, just waiting for your feedbacks on the day today. I hope you had a productive day today. Uh, you utilized three hours and it was not a waste of time coming to this three hour session live. Uh, so thank you very much for the feedback and thank you very much for participating in this live webinar. Uh, I, you have still five weeks before exams. I hope you implement the learnings you got from each session yesterday and today. And tomorrow is yet another important session where I'll come back with ethical, professional and quality control issues, right? OK, thank you very much, all of you. Have a nice day. I'll see you back tomorrow live 8.30 p.m. Pakistan Standard Time for day three and utilize the next 24 hours very carefully because every day counts towards your exams coming up on 7th of December. I'm signing off. I'm uh, signing off as tutor for this webinar. I'm Kashif Kamran signing off from the AAA practice to pass webinar day two and I'll see you back with day three tomorrow. Take care. Goodbye everyone.